Hey photographers, you know that annoying interview question where they ask you what's your worst quality and you know what to say. Oh, I'm always too early for appointments or uh, I hate to leave on time because I want to make sure my work is finished before the end of the day. Well, the Sony RX10 Model 4 is that kind of an overachiever. Way too many tricks to keep track of. There's the 25 time zoom lens, the 240 frame slow motion, 4K video with log picture profiles, mic in, headphone out, a button on the lens for eye autofocus, an aperture ring, a 24 frame per second electronic burst, picture effects like watercolor, six stop HDR. I've liked the RX10 series since version two. And what I particularly like about Model 3 and now Model 4 is the 24 to 600 millimeter large aperture 25 time zoom. I was delighted by the images that it enabled me to capture. I find it a pleasure to hold. The grip is not only deep enough, but it's wide enough so that when I place it in my palm, my thumb fits perfectly in the grip on the back, my fingers fall into place on the molded grip, and my index finger sits over the shutter button. And my left hand also. With the corner in my palm, I can press the focus hold button, adjust the aperture ring, focus, and zoom. That said, turning on the camera takes a few seconds as the lens extends, and a full 9 centimeter zoom out to 600 millimeters using the zoom lever, which includes some retrograde action, isn't particularly speedy at normal, but can be faster with a menu setting. And then turning the zoom ring will require several hand repositions while you get from one end to the other. That too can be adjusted with menu settings. But this is as ergonomically pleasant as any camera I've tried. And although it's a good size, it's not too heavy, just over a kilo with battery and SD card. Inside is a 20 megapixel one inch sensor, which, although it has limited low light capability, should satisfy all but the most demanding professionals. The mode dial and menu button are on the left side. On a mirrorless camera, I find the left side menu button awkward. On the mode dial, Panorama gets its own spot. Eh, separate card door slot on the right, up to SDXC UHS-1. Battery door on the bottom, nicely far from the tripod socket centered under the lens, and with the knockout for an external power battery. Viewfinder centered over the lens, with a diopter that exceeds my prescription so I can shoot without glasses, and I can easily see the whole 2.4 million dot OLED screen. The monitor screen tilts up and partially down, no swivel, and this is a very limited touch screen. Touch focus but not snap, touch panel focus in the viewfinder mode, and that's it. There's a display panel on top. It's blank when the camera is off and displays battery, card space, shutter and aperture but not ISO or EV, and then white balance and drive mode. ISO, but not EV setting, is displayed when it's adjusted. Incidentally, ISO 100 to 12.8, auto with base and maximum, that's not as extensive as I expected. Before I get to the ISO samples, I'm going to set the quality to JPEG extra fine. By default, it's just fine. And the JPEG with RAW is also just fine. ISO 6400 seems very usable, with some pixel smoothing and noise at 12.8. Use the menu to set the auto ISO triggering shutter speed for aperture and program modes, and Sony provides five methods. Fast and faster prioritizes shutter speed, slow and slower prioritizes ISO. So here, standard sets the shutter at 125th with an ISO of 8000. With faster, the shutter's 1 200th, with an ISO of 12.8. Slower, the shutter's 1 30th, with an ISO of 2000. That's the most extensive auto ISO I've seen, which really adds to its usefulness. EV adjustment dial plus or minus three with a dedicated dial on top. The back dial is program shift in program mode, shutter in s and &M. Manual shooting is accommodated with the lens's exposure ring, although the lens is ramped, which means that as you zoom, the iris will close from f2.4 to f4 by the time you reach 100 millimeters, even though it's physically set at f2.4. 
five meter modes. In addition to matrix, center, and spot, Sony has added full screen and highlight, useful to keep highlights from blowing out and to keep performers on stage properly exposed. The display carousel includes a histogram as well as a level. And the viewfinder companion settings screen is interactive. Just press the fun button to adjust the settings on the right. In other modes, the fun button opens the fun menu to make adjustments. The settings available here can all be customized and arranged. The built-in flash is rated from 1 to 10 meters, and there's a Sony proprietary multi-interface shoe for optional flashes, as well as a menu of flash options. The lens focuses as close as 3 centimeters when wide, but when fully zoomed in, the closest focus is over 70 centimeters. Either provides a decent macro capability. Five position focus switch on the front. Focus area selected using the fun menu. Wide, center, three sizes of flexible spot and expand flexible spot, which will increase the area automatically if nothing is found in the area. Move the point with touch or the control dial. And as you can see with continuous wide, there's a very large coverage area. Most of the time focus is relatively quick, but not so much if it has a long way to go. The back focus is easy, select DMF and press the AF on button on the lens. Remove autofocus from the shutter button on photo menu screen five. Worth noting that the focus hold button on the lens can also be assigned to eye autofocus which I find useful for shooting close-up portraits. For manual focus, skip over to page 13 to change the direction of the focus ring, and onto camera tab 2, page 9, to select which of the lens's two rings controls focus. Although I love the flexibility and control, the menu could be better organized. In manual, turning the focus ring activates expanded view, press the center button to zoom in further, and this feature is controlled on menu screen 12, MF Assist. It can be difficult to hold the camera steady when you're at 600 millimeters with the stills stabilization on screen 5, and don't confuse this with the video stabilization on screen 3, you can see a marked improvement. And there's a new feature that I found really useful, Zoom Assist, as it's so easy to lose a moving subject when you're fully zoomed in. Once assigned to a custom button, C3 is not assigned by default, so that's where I put it, press and the RX10-4 zooms out to find your subject again, release and it resumes. Let's try the burst mode, recording extra fine JPEGs to a UHS-1U3 card with manual settings. In high speed, it's the electronic shutter and it held at 24 frames per second for 10 seconds, then it slowed to three per. There is a shutter sound, which can be disabled, and then it's completely silent. Incidentally, with the shutter sounds turned off, the actual mechanical shutter sound is very subtle and quiet. With the mechanical shutter, the mid-speed, I counted 10 frames per second for 30 seconds before it slowed to 3 or so. Those are impressive numbers. With high speed, that's the equivalent of 10 seconds of video with a resolution over 6K. Now, it does take a long time, up to 90 seconds, for the buffer to clear, during which time the menu is not available. A good set of white balance presets, Kelvin setting, and three custom slots. Use the set position to capture from a gray card. Sony engineers have listened. You can now set white balance in video mode. Color profiles, called creative styles here, include a collection of presets with adjustments for contrast, saturation, and sharpness, and then you can use the six style box slots to create and save your own versions. Although not available with RAW, the picture effects include an additional set of more dramatic adjustments. These can create some dynamic images, and while I like some of the effects, one of the issues that continues to plague this and other Sony models is that one feature, seemingly unrelated, will prevent another from working. Now, combined with a menu system that often fails to explain and is frequently inconsistent, 
frustration lurks on just about every menu screen. And let's go with an example here. When RAW is on, picture effects are not available, with an error message that explains, but why not just turn off RAW right here? Instead, we navigate from screen 10 to 1, to the quality settings, disable RAW, and then back to page 10 to select the picture effect. So far, so good. But inconsistently, if I now turn RAW back on, picture effects automatically turn off. So why not the opposite? And really, what is the underlying engineering problem here? Why can't Sony engineers figure out how to save a JPEG file with an effect and a RAW file without? They could ask the engineers at Olympus, who seem to have figured that one out. Or drive mode. If we want high burst, why can't we just be told that it's switching from mechanical to electronic shutter? Why do we have to dive back to the menu to reset this? One more example, 4K output to HDMI. These menu functions could make you crazy. I'm in movie mode and I've selected 4K 3100. The HDMI output is giving me 4K 30, well, 2997 really, or 24, really 23.98 if I've selected the 24 frame setting. Then off to setup 3 for HDMI settings. Ah, here we are, yes, memory card plus HDMI, but wait. If I HDMI 30 or 24, it forces the HDMI to that setting regardless of the movie menu, but no SD card recording. And now, the HDMI settings menu. Item 2, that does nothing. So I don't understand why it's not dimmed out. Although the info display is, that's not available in 4K. So what does the 2460 setting do? Well, if you're in HD, all outputs are 1080, 60, whether you select 60, 30, or 24. And as long as you leave the HDMI resolution in auto, they will remain 60, and even though the 2460 switch isn't dimmed, it doesn't work. But change the HDMI resolution from auto to 2160 1080, and only now does the 2460 switch actually have the intended effect. And the 4K output select still overrides everything else. Again, ridiculous usability problems that could and should be solved with better engineering. And it's not just the RX 10.4 that has this issue. Every recent Sony model is similarly plagued. So one more time, let me challenge the Sony user experience team and the Sony engineers to fix this issue. Let's combine all of these settings to one place where they do what you think they're going to do. While I'm ranting, the menu looks organized, but I'm not sure why some things qualified for camera tab 1 and others ended up on 2. There are focus settings on screens 5 and 6, more on 12 and 13. The redeeming feature here is My Menu, to store the 6 settings you're most likely to want to change. Otherwise, finding a feature can be a challenge. Now, just to conclude with the color adjustments, there are picture profiles, a feature that's mostly designed for video, but works for stills as well. The capabilities, which govern just about every possible setting that affects dynamic range and color, are nearly endless. The feature here is gamma, which changes the response curve of the sensor to extend the dynamic range. For extreme dynamic range, use the S-Log gamma settings that can capture a wider range, a feature that can be particularly useful in bright sunlight, but as it captures a very flat image, it requires post-processing to create the final result. So, where a standard setting might overexpose the sky and leave the shadows without detail, the S-Log settings can help create a usable image. If that's feeling a little complex, use Auto HDR. Sadly, not compatible with RAW, but it can provide up to six stops of additional latitude, which is kind of like an auto bracket feature, taking multiple images and combining them into a single exposure. The RX 10.4 is a solid video performer. All four exposure modes from program to manual selected on the menu when the dial is on video. And although it's not with the other custom buttons on the menu, you can adapt the shutter button to start and stop video, but stay tuned. XAVCS in 4K and HD as well as AVC HD. In NTSC, 4K at 24 and 30 frames, with data rates up to 100 megabits at the UHD 3840 by 2160 resolution. 
HD 24 to 60 at 50 megabits, as well as 120 at 100. All are limited to 30 minutes for a single recording. And then, on a different menu, HFR recording, with its own exposure modes. HFR also has its own position on the mode dial. Then, set the exposure and focus, and press the center button to enter standby. They can't be adjusted afterwards. You choose your playback rate, called the record setting, and your recording frame rate, 240, 480, and 960. Combined, these provide slow rates from 4 times, matching 60 frames with 240, up to 40 times, matching 24 frames with 960. Clips are limited to 3 to 4 seconds, and there's a bit of a quality resolution change as you increase the frame rate. And after the recording buffers, it does take it a while to save. At 240 frames, the image is 1824 by 1026 pixels, about 90% of HD, and a bitrate of 50 megabits. That goes down to about 50% of HD at 480, with the same bitrate, and about 25% the resolution at 960, still with a 50 megabit data rate. Low quality, but sometimes that's worth it. But if you do want slow motion, you may find your best value in the 120 frame HD mode, which you can slow down in editing. Its time limit is 30 minutes, and it records sound. It records at full HD resolution, so no, you won't be able to slow it down as much, but... The RX10 IV does take stills while recording video, just not in 4K. You'll see the icon top left. But in HD, you can press the shutter to take an image. So, remember when I set the shutter button to start and stop video? You have to reset that to take photos while recording. Menu option to select the image size for dual record, which is what Sony calls this feature. There's also auto dual record with three frequencies. This mode works best when recording people. It prefers faces and smiles and takes photos automatically. The real dual recording mode is called proxy recording. This isn't available in AVC HD, 120 frame HD, or with Intelligent Active Steady Shot, and it disables the photo dual record. Also, when proxy's on, there's no HDMI output when recording externally. The proxy file is HD 720 with a 10 megabit data rate. Video files are saved in the private clip folder proxy files in the subfolder. One of the things that Sony does that most of the competition doesn't is to support shutter speeds lower than the frame rate, which I like to blur movement. Focus. In video mode, all positions except M are continuous, and in video, manual focus doesn't automatically provide the expanded view, so I change custom 1 to focus magnifier and set the otherwise not set right button to ISO. Press the button to set the area, move it to your focus point, press again for the expanded view, focus, and then press once more to return to the standard view. For video specific steady shot settings in HD, switch to 4K and only standard is available. Well, this is the off setting on HD footage, typical shaky handheld camera on a windy day. It's better with steady shot on at standard. Then switching to intelligent, which crops in a bit, I don't really see an improvement. An extensive and useful zebra menu for exposure, including not only percentage specific settings from 70 to 100 plus, but also two custom ranges, set the target and the deviation or a lower limit with a range from 50 to 109. You'll want to assign Zebra to a custom button if you use this feature. Use the Disk button to check the histogram, and while you're cycling through, check the level. This too can be customized to show only the screens you want in the display carousel. There's a grid overlay display on camera 2 screen 7, and on screen 4, marker settings, which are also useful for composition and alignment, but using this function disables the grid. Not sure why they're not combined. Mic in for audio, headphone out for monitoring. And this is a good time to mention that the port covers, which snap close nicely and have a little lip to make them easy to open, 
are about the best on any Sony model. More, please. You can set the record level, but you can't turn off the limiter, so record low if you don't want overly compressed audio. Meter display turns on here as well. Live HDMI out on a micro connector. Lots of settings, not all of which are what they seem. Clean and overlay options. In 4K, only clean is available. In 4K, there's no display on the camera monitor while you're recording. By the light of a single candle, face detect is kind of working. I've got using autofocus continuous and face detect on a Sony camera doesn't usually work, particularly if I have my glasses on. So I'm kind of pleased with this as a result, although I can see that the focus is wandering in and out just a little bit for this shot. So single candle, 1 30th is our shutter speed and our aperture is f3.2, which is as wide open as we can get with uh, this focal length. The ISO then is 8000. In the picture it looks just a little bit noisy. We did set a custom white balance which ends up to be about 2600 Kelvin. To minimize the bendy effect of a rolling shutter, shoot at HD 120. It's much more obvious at HD 60 and 30 and at 4K. I kind of expected that with a smaller sensor in a larger body, the RX-10 would not be subject to the kinds of overheating issues seen in the A6000 and A7 series, and I had just enough juice in a single battery to fill up a 64GB SD card with 87 minutes of 4K video, without seeing the overheating icon. And unlike the recent versions of those other models, there's no override to the overheating setting in the menu here. Of course, you can extend battery life by plugging in a USB power source, and you can get larger SD cards, so the only real issue here is the 30 minute limit. But beware that there must be some charge in the internal battery or the USB power doesn't work, and the internal battery does drain when USB is connected, just not as fast. The RX10 4's ad hoc Wi-Fi can be used to send images to a smartphone or tablet in conjunction with Sony's free Play Memories app. The QR code should make it easier to connect. Images transfer by selecting on the camera or the phone. To transfer movies, select which version, but even the proxy files can take a long time to copy. The app also supports remote control, using the camera's control with smartphone setting. Both stills and video can be controlled, and although you'll have to change the mode dial on the camera, the other settings are available on screen. There's a mirror mode for vlogging. Now, I couldn't get Bluetooth to work, which may be specific to this unit, and HDMI recordings were occasionally flaky, but that could be my cable. Sony really deprioritizes playback with a minimal set of features. There's no support for raw conversion. Video capture doesn't support trimming, but it does support stills capture. And the intriguing motion shot video is available only from AVCHD files. And there's an option to set the frequency of the stills. Now I like this, but once the effect is created, I couldn't find any way to save it as an image or as a video. Now, what's missing? A swivel for the monitor so it faces front, so useful for vlogging. And why is there no ND filter? And there's neither an intervalometer or a time-lapse feature. And while other recent Sony models support downloadable apps which include time-lapse, they've been overlooked on the RX10 IV. UHS-2 support and higher bit rates for video would be nice too. And one feature I'd like to have removed why, oh why, can't we have an unlimited video recording mode? Battery life seems better than average, but it does use the same small battery Sony's been using, not the new larger one used in the A9. However, it can be USB powered, a very useful feature. Thanks for watching. Remember to keep shooting until your battery is empty and your memory card is full. As long as you're clicking, please click on like, and if you have questions or comments, use the field below. I do read and reply to all relevant questions and civil comments. Now, if you've got one more click, please subscribe.